Welcome back to the Complete History of Coffee, Episode 24, The Great Depression, Part 2. Grab your favorite caffeinated beverage and let's get started. So since we are covering the period in which the prohibition ends, I decided to throw in a tasting from our new beer history episode. So today we are going to be trying a cowgirl coffee stout. This is from Tractor Brewing Company here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So let's start by smelling it. Smells kind of sweet. Um, definitely has kind of like a, a stout profile to it um you know kind of that darker roastier aspect kind of like you would get from coffee uh, it has a lot of bitter um there's almost like some vanilla notes to it i don't actually get as much of the coffee as you might from some other stouts but i do know that this was brewed with coffee Kind of gives me more of like a dark brown beer rather than like a stout. I mean, it's it's definitely dark. It's it's roasty, but it doesn't have quite as much of the uh, the roasty kick as you might normally get from a stout. Um, it actually kind of reminds me a little bit of like a milk stout, a little bit. Pretty smooth flavor, not too hoppy, um, but still fairly bitter. So let's go ahead and get into the Great Depression in the United States. Last episode, we focused a lot on the Great Depression's effect on Latin America. So this time, we will be taking a better look at its effect on coffee in the United States. Looking to America in the 1920s, we find coffee yet again under attack from religion, this time by the Mormon Church. Seventh-day Adventist, and Judaism. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known as Mormons, avoid tea and coffee for fear of its spiritual and physical effects. See, Joseph Smith, their founder, declared in his revelation titled Word of Wisdom, quote, hot drinks are not for the belly, end quote. A simple solution to this seems to me that one could simply drink cold brew. But for many, such as one of my best friends growing up, this has come to mean a restriction on caffeine. Many members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church similarly avoid coffee and tea for its caffeinated qualities, as well as being encouraged to abstain from all stimulants. Paul Crystal points out in his book, Coffee, A Drink for the Devil, that as a result, modern researchers have examined them to better understand the health effects of drinking coffee. One study he mentioned found a higher chance of ischemic heart disease and cardiovascular disease in people who consume coffee. We also find an argument amongst Jews on whether coffee was a seed or a legume. Now, typically, that wouldn't matter, but like how many Catholics won't eat meat during Lent, Orthodox Jews can't eat seeds during Passover. Now, technically, they're not supposed to eat the seeds of grains during this time, as a reminder of the Jews who fled Egypt and didn't have time to let their bread rise, but some have expanded this to include all seeds. Finally, in 1923, Maxwell House Coffee chimed in and answered the question, defining coffee beans as a berry, while today most call it a cherry. But before we get into how Maxwell dominated much of the market during the Depression, let's look at what led to their success during such an economically disastrous period. A relatively new invention was making a change in advertisement during this period, one which could reach a larger audience than most anything else, and which could do it instantly. Radio. Beginning around 1905, radio wasn't something which took off for commercial use until the 1920s. Atlantic and Pacific began their own show in 1924, A&P Gypsies. Jewel Tea Company created Jewel Tea Hour, and Folgers had Folgeria. 
But by the 1930s, everyone was listening to the radio, which created a greater importance on its use for advertisement. Which seems to parallel the 2020s today in which television is the main way that people consume ads, but now we're shifting towards a format of shorter content, such as TikToks and YouTube, in which many companies now pay ads for these formats. Around this time, General Foods looked at its advertising agencies to increase sales on their products. J. Walter Thompson had given up their Maxwell House account, taking over Chase and Sanborn instead, leaving the agency Irwin Wesse in charge of the account. Wesse was not managing the account as well as the corporation had hoped, however, and so they placed two men working on other General Foods accounts on Maxwell. Those men, Chester Bowles and Bill Benton, along with Erwin Wesse, account manager, Atherton Hobbler, became partners in a new firm, which began planning a solution to increase Maxwell House sales. Fierce advertising by every major coffee brand meant General Foods needed an edge. Chase and Sanborn boasted their vacuum-sealed coffee, complete with expiration dates to ensure freshness. So, in response, General Foods released a new method of vacuum packing, which was even more effective at removing air, and they had a huge light-up sign built in Times Square to advertise their coffee. In fact, they gave the new advertising firm $3.1 million to ensure Maxwell would be the top-selling coffee in America. But still, their coffee wouldn't sell. Atherton Hobbler addressed the issue with three simple solutions. First, they needed to use less Brazilian coffee and start using better coffee from other countries. Second, their coffee was too expensive for what it was, so cut the price down by a nickel. Finally, they could cut their advertising budget in half, but it all needed to be directed at radio. The company came up with the new radio show, Maxwell House Showboat. The show apparently stole songs from a musician, Jerome Kerm, for the theme, which at first upset the composer. But after he listened to the show, his lawyer stated, quote, he is a regular listener, end quote, going on to say, quote, which he not only enjoys, but which he also considers the best program ever put on the air, end quote. So I guess he decided not to sue them. The show took people on a journey with sound effects and music kind of sounds like a good idea for a podcast. Listeners were so immersed in the show, they felt like they were actually on a boat, to the point where fans of the show went to docks in New Orleans to see the boat when the show was set there, while others wanted tickets to go aboard the boat, but no actual boat existed. From 1933 to 1935, the Maxwell House showboat was the top radio show in the country. It was the first show to have a live audience, and it introduced cue cards for the audience to laugh and applaud, giving us the now-classic sitcom soundtracks. <laughs> During this time, Benton and Bowles created two other radio shows, Palm Live Beauty Box and Town Hall Tonight, which also became hits, with all three of their shows being in the top four most listened shows in the country. The agency went on to create photographed actors for the showboat for print ads and even comic trips for Maxwell House ads. Other coffee companies attempted to compete by creating radio shows, but no one was quite as successful. While most businesses struggled during the Depression, this was not the case for everyone, as Bill Benton put it, quote, Maxwell House didn't know there was a Depression, end quote. Their sales continued to shoot up. The prohibition came to an end in December of 1933, but surprisingly, this didn't mean a decline in coffee sales due to competition. Coffee had already become a popular drink, and due to caffeine's addictive qualities, it was here to stay. Plus, many people saw coffee as the perfect drink to help them sober up or recover from a hangover. The partners in the Benton and Bowles agency all became very wealthy and affluential from their work on Maxwell House, with Bowles even becoming the governor of Connecticut and appointing Benton to the Senate to fight McCarthy's Salem Witch Trial during the Red Scare. Eventually, Benton went so far away from advertising, he actually seemed to regret having ever created the Maxwell House show, at one point talking about modern commercials, stating, quote, 
I invented things I now apologize for. End quote. I think many of us are surprised to find out some companies thrived during the Depression, like Maxwell or Chase and Sanborn. But what about other brands? When we last talked about Arbuckle, they had gone down a path from being a giant in the industry towards a failing company. So, of course, as many struggled in the Depression, so too did the once great Arbuckle brothers. After Jameson's sister took over the company, they tried to reverse the company's downward spiral. But their efforts were in vain as the whole estate somehow vanished by the 1940s. General Foods eventually acquired the company, meaning Maxwell House and Eubin were now under the same roof. Alice Foote McDougall similarly faced hardship after her business passed into new management in 1930. However, she came back out of retirement two years later and was able to increase business again, even buying back two of the former locations which had been sold off during the Depression. But as other coffee shops competed with lower prices during this financial hard period, many customers simply couldn't afford the higher-priced Italian-style cafe. It also didn't help that automats began taking off at this time. For those of you wondering, an automat is essentially a restaurant with only vending machines to serve you food. And while it didn't affect Maxwell, the final blow to McDougall's company came after the 21st Amendment ended the Prohibition in 1933, leading her son, Alan, to become a trader in wines and liquors. The Depression did not set back America's coffee industry, but similarly led to consolidation of larger companies. This trend is something we've been looking at since the start of the 20th century, as these larger companies will continue taking over other coffee companies, over time becoming the conglomerates we know today. During the mid-1930s, there was an interesting tactic which developed to increase shopping in stores. This involved selling coffee at, or even below, wholesale price. So while it may have increased coffee sales in those stores, it harmed other sales of coffee who were used to selling the coffee at a marked-up price to make a profit. But one area of the market which still allowed for a good profit from coffee sales was restaurants, hotels, offices, and ship lines. One man attempted to enter this area of the market by launching Martinson's Coffee in the New York area. He sold only one high-grade brand of coffee, which actually worked well for him as he had much of his money from hotels, restaurants, and steamship lines. Steamships were the cruise ships of their day, with notable ships including the Titanic, Lusitania, and Queen Mary. Sam Chonburn similarly began a high-end coffee brand, Saverin. The two companies became rivals on the luxury coffee market, but were both able to sustain their prices during the Depression, and even thrive. A further change to the coffee industry was the transition of the National Coffee Roasters Association into the Associated Coffee Industries of America. This was due to the need for coffee roasters to begin working with other parts of the industry, namely chain stores, green coffee importers, and the conglomerates which were beginning to form. But none of the coffee businesses wanted to pay for advertising to help support their competitors. Let's take a look at some other major coffee brands during the period of the Great Depression. Oddly enough, most of the major brands saw a change in management as many of their owners passed away around the mid-1930s. Folger's head Frank Otha and Ernest Folger both passed away in 1935 and 36, respectively, leaving the company in the hands of Russell Otha, Peter Folger, and James Folger III. So while Folger's was now in its third generation of owners, Hills Brothers was entering its second generation. After Austin and Reuben Hills both passed in 1933 and 34, respectively. You can't help but feel like there's some kind of conspiracy involving the assassination of all the heads of the coffee industry, but uh, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, Hills Brothers was treading high with over $5 million in the bank in 1930. Even so, Maxwell House and Chase Sanborn were the largest companies during the time, with their radio shows giving them the best method of reaching new customers. 
But the following year, in 1931, they sent out half-pound samples of coffee to over 500,000 people in Chicago. As a result, they became the top-selling coffee brand in Chicago for 20 years after this. However, the company actually went down in sales overall during the Depression, but they refused to sell the company to a conglomerate. They stuck with their high-quality beans, but slowly lost customers to cheaper brands. What Hills Brothers really needed was a successful radio show like Maxwell House. But as 1935 rolled in, so too did new media, namely TV shows. One such show was Major Bowes' Amateur Hour. This show was created by Edward Bowes to promote Chase and Sanborn. The show was, as the name describes, a show for amateur performers to get radio time. But they were being judged on their performance and would get the gong if they did bad. Much like America's Got Talent was Simon Cowell's harsh criticism. You can't sing. Well, I think I can. But I just think you should give us a chance. But a chance to do what? To improve. Yeah, girls, we have weeks, not decades. They traveled around the country, giving locals everywhere the chance to compete. Listeners could vote for their favorite performers, but were encouraged to buy more coffee to help support the show, and the chance for more performers to be on the show. Speaking of which, one such performer on the show was actually Frank Sinatra, where he performed with the Hoboken Four. All contestants were given $10 and a free meal ticket for an all-you-can-eat buffet. But they also had to sign a contract which gave Bose 15% of all their future earnings, assuming the show helped kickstart their career. Kind of scummy if you ask me, but the show still did very well, with Edward Bose even becoming the honorary governor of Louisiana when the show traveled there. Eventually, the gong was removed under the guidance of J. Walter Thompson, and as a result of many fans of the show who wanted to watch each contestant's full performance. The show overtook Maxwell House in 1935, and would continue even when Bose left to work Chrysler in the summer of 1937. A new host for the Chase and Sanborn Hour was found with Edgar Bergen. Bergen used a wooden dummy named Charlie McCarthy for the show, and in fact the dummy was more so the star than Bergen. While initially successful, eventually a scandalous episode of the show led to trouble. See, in winter of that year, a guest on the show, Mae West, the sex queen, performed a rather sexually driven skit with the dummy Charlie. Essentially, it was about Eve, as in Old Testament Eve, trying to seduce Charlie, who was portraying the serpent. Many viewers were outraged, especially because the sexually driven skit was through one of the most famous stories from the Bible. So Standard Browns apologized to the public on behalf of their brand, Chase and Sanborn. But Mae West, the queen that she is, refused to apologize. She responded by stating, quote, Did they expect a sermon? Why weren't they at church if they were so religious? End quote. For context, the show ran every Sunday evening. In any case, this actually led to greater success for the show, as the show grew in views after this event. Guests would drink coffee on the show, and listeners were told their ticket to the show was simply their loyalty to the coffee brand. In fact, they surpassed Maxwell House Showboat, so much so that it was taken off the air at the end of the 1930s. But Maxwell responded the following year by creating the Baby Snook Show. Comedian and actress Fanny Bryce hosted the show, bringing on many movie stars from MGM Studios. Some other interesting shows of note from this time include Folger's Judy and Jane, a detective series. G. Washington, the instant coffee company we talked about in our World War I episode, had a brain teaser show called Professor Quiz and His Brain Busters. Coffee companies during the Depression were locked into a fierce battle for supremacy on the market. This was not limited to radio and TV shows, as we find print ads being used as a weapon against rival companies. Hill's brothers created an ad directed at housewives to encourage their coffee as a means to protect against aggressive husbands, as the ad suggested, quote, nothing soothes the savage, masculine heart more quickly, end quote. Hill's brothers felt the change in price of Maxwell House, 
who had lowered the price of their coffee by a nickel in 1934. One of the new owners, Gray Hills, responded by reluctantly paying for radio ads. Similar to Chase and Sanborn, they sent out thousands of half-pound samples to people in New York. This tactic worked for the company, as they doubled their annual sales over the next five years. Chase and Sanborn focused on their coffee's freshness, with ads suggesting housewives should buy their brand for abusive husbands, who might use bad coffee as an excuse to beat their wives. I would like to think these ads were like the far-fetched ads we see all the time today, holding little in the way of reality. But as Mark Pendergast points out, the ads may have held some basis in reality of the time, with some men feeling emasculated or powerless after having lost their jobs in the Depression, leading them to use something as insignificant as a bad cup of coffee as an excuse to lash out at their wives. As for alternatives to coffee, we find even more companies battling for customers. On the part of Postum, General Foods created a cartoon strip about Mr. Coffee Nerves to help boost sales. Now, Mr. Coffee Nerves was no hero, but rather a bad guy with a mustache and a top hat who was wreaking havoc until Postum was able to thwart his diabolical plans. Based on this description, I imagine he looks something like the villain from the movie Meet the Robinsons. Everyone will tell you to let it go and move on, but don't. Instead, let it fester and boil inside of you. Take these feelings and lock them away. Let them fuel your actions. Let hate be your ally, and you will be capable of wonderfully horrid things. Olvain, a supposedly healthy drink of the time, which was like a cross between one of those egg white protein shakes and an unfermented beer, was seeking to gain new customers from the coffee market. Something else new in this period was decaffeinated coffee, a process created by Ludwig Roselius in 1903. Apparently, his father passed away from too much coffee drinking, and so he sought a way to take caffeine out of the drink. He is said to have come across this by accident after a shipment of coffee came from a boat that had been flooded with salt water from the ocean, causing the beans to be decaffeinated as a result. From this, we ended up with Coffeeha and Sanka, the two major decaf brands of the period. Kellogg's Coffee Hog followed in Postum steps, launching a cartoon strip, but this time about a maid. Not a villainous maid, though, just one who wished to prevent her employer's bad driving, which was apparently brought on from coffee. So the maid substituted her caffeinated coffee for decaf, and she suddenly could drive better. Truly miraculous. Kellogg also resorted to scare tactics similar to those seen in the early days of Postum. Sanka, which was owned by General Foods, also bashed on coffee, but with less focus on scaring people. Instead, they created ads which questioned why people drink coffee since it's from the seed of a coffee plant. Their logic being, we completely throw out most other seeds from things like apples, so why would you want to drink a plant seed? Their solution? To remove the caffeine from coffee like you would take the seed out of an apple. Truly genius. Aside from the part where now you're still drinking bitter seed water, but with no benefit of caffeine. But don't worry, their brand isn't going anywhere, as General Foods would buy out Coffee Hog in 1939, giving the company a monopoly on America's decaf industry. And if these non-caffeinated drink alternatives weren't enough, Coca-Cola and Pepsi were now threatening to take over the market. Coke dominated much of the South during the 30s and was spreading across the rest of America, while Pepsi was gaining traction by offering its product as a cheaper alternative to Coke during the hard times of the Depression. Aiding in coffee's popularity, though, was the creation of the Drip Coffee Maker in 1908 and the creation of the Vacuum Coffee Maker. The Vacuum Coffee Maker of the time was the Silex Brewer, created in 1909 by two sisters in Massachusetts. It was based on a French design from the 1840s, created by Madame Vesu. This design is essentially our modern siphon coffee maker, 
the glass chemistry experiment looking device I used in episode 18 for a coffee tasting. The Silex was more of an upscale item, largely for restaurants or wealthy people to show off in their kitchens. While the drip coffee maker was, and still is, the common man's coffee maker. All these coffee makers, of course, need different settings on a grinder, allowing for Maxwell to advertise grinding levels for every method. Hills Brothers won up them by advertising their brand as the correct grind for every coffee maker. Which, although an utter lie, this was of course at a time before Google and smartphones, so I'm sure many believe this to be the case. All of this put together created a paradoxical culture around coffee drinking, in which coffee brands had now trained consumers to buy fresh coffee, avoid stale coffee, use the right grind in coffee maker, and buy higher quality beans. All the while, they were confusing customers on coffee grinders, cutting corners on their lower end brands by using inferior beans, and sometimes even adding back in chaff to the grind. Chaff being the inner skin of the coffee fruit, known as the silver skin. Jewel Tea Company, as well as chain stores like Atlantic and Pacific, were thriving at this time without the need for any such ads. Jewel actually called out other brands, stating, quote, We don't know of any coffee so poor that it will make a man desert his family, horse whip his wife, or shoot his dinographer, end quote. Jewel actually faced some issues initially in the 30s, as Green River Ordinances were created all around the country to ban out-of-state solicitation. It was named so after the town in Wyoming, Green River, first passed such a law. They could get around this if customers invited the company to visit their house, but they needed a better solution. So dozens of storefronts were opened in 1932 to sell their goods. Eventually, the ordinance was overturned in court, and they continued operating as a delivery service, greatly expanding across the country over the next few years. This meant their company was actually able to hire people at the time when many other companies were doing layoffs. Looking at Atlantic and Pacific, we find them entering the Depression in 1929, very well off financially, making over $1 billion that year. As the height of the depression hit, the company was still well off, making over $100 million that year in profits. A&P was in fact the third largest coffee brand during the depression. Their coffees were typically 12 to 20 cents lower in price than the other big companies, Maxwell and Chase and Sanborn. They had a high-end coffee, Bokar, a low-end brand, 8 o'clock, and a mid-grade, Red Circle. They used advertisements such as Coffee Time, a 15-minute show which featured Kate Smith singing her newest hits. But in all, they didn't need much advertising beyond their own stores. As the mid-30s rolled in, the depression began to hit. This was less to do with coffee competition and more to do with overall rival grocery stores, which popped up in many abandoned buildings left after businesses went bankrupt from the depression. These new stores were actually the beginning of supermarkets. They gained such popularity by cutting prices down, hurting sales for not only a and but also places like Kroger and Safeway. They did this saving money by allowing customers to use shopping carts themselves to get their items, only needing someone to cash them out at the end of their shopping. What do they think of next? Having customers check themselves out? A&P realized they needed to respond, and so they closed many of their slower locations and opened up their own supermarkets across America. But the country pushed back against the rising supermarket trend, passing anti-chain store legislation that added extra tax to chains in 1931, which allowed each state to decide on such taxes. Over the next two years, 13 states did in fact enact such legislation hurting the already fragile Depression-era a and This anti-big business mentality was in stark contrast to the pro-business era seen during the Roaring Twenties. These various chain stores came together in 1935 to form the American Retail Federation, but this immediately backfired as Congress launched an investigation on them for super lobbying. 
the investigation was led by Wright Patman, who would go on to spend the next 30 years trying to bring down the, quote, unholy alliance of tremendous concentrated wealth and enormous influence, end quote, as he described them. A&P was discovered to have been receiving $8 million a year for what they called advertising allowance brokerage fees from companies which included the likes of General Foods for their brand Maxwell House and standard brands for Chase and Sanborn. This was, and still is, a common practice where companies pay a store slotting allowance for their product to be well placed on the shelves. So Patman passed an act in 1936 which prevented these advertising allowances, which gave change so much influence on the market. This almost led the company to shut down all of its stores and instead focus purely on manufacturing its own products to sell to other stores, which worried General Foods and Standard Brands as this would mean a bigger competitor in all grocery stores. But as it turns out, the robinson patman Act was vague and didn't actually stop them from being able to charge such allowances. Patman pushed for legislation in 1938 which heavily taxed chains with A&P being expected to pay $471 million that year, with the company only making $9 million after said taxes. The following year, the company created an ad campaign called A Statement of Public Policy, which pushed not for the owners, but for the workers. It stated the owners could retire comfortably if all their stores closed down but employees, customers, and the farms who sold them all their products would suffer. In a stroke of luck, the campaign actually succeeded. During the congressional hearings, they were able to bring in 150 witnesses from the many different industries to speak on behalf of the company, putting an end to Patman's bill in 1940. So when all the depression was merely a minor setback for many coffee companies, a setback which will end suddenly as a conflict across the ocean draws America into war, World War II is on the horizon. So get ready because next episode we will see how coffee acted as the driving force for the largest war in history. But before we end the episode, I want to make a quick announcement. I recently started my own YouTube channel called Eris Zaffer Studios. If you are interested, I will post a link on our social media pages from the Complete History Podcast series, or you can go onto YouTube directly and search Eris Zaffer Studios. I am currently working on a vlog from the most haunted ship in the world, the Queen Mary, and I hope to have many more videos to come. If you are watching this episode on YouTube, I will put a link in the description below. This show is written and produced by me, Eris Zaffer. If you have not already, please consider supporting this podcast series on Patreon. For the price of a latte a month, you can support this and future projects in this series, while getting access to members' episodes, the transcripts of the show, and a chance to win merch. Speaking of merch, don't forget to pick up a new shirt, hoodie, or mug from our merch site to support your favorite coffee podcast. Make sure to join us on our community on social media at the Complete History Podcast Series. If you would like to contact us, you can message us through social media or at our email, completehistorypod at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on and make sure to share it with your family and friends. To close, here is a quote from Norman Lloyd. The Depression was remarkable because you had nothing and the salaries when you got a job were very low or very small. See, a donut was 10 cents. A cup of coffee was a nickel. That was lunch with an apple. And I would be playing a lead on a Broadway show on that kind of diet. Thank you.